Those Pueblos class of 2020. I don't know if you guys have felt this, but when you go outside, it feels like it's a really bad movie. And while I'm on lockdown in my house, it's a Christmas movie. I'm talking about Home Alone. Elf, it's a wonderful life. I need another one. What's another one? <laughs> Miracle on 34th Street. And while in quarantine Christmas, some of your teachers and administrators hit me up and said, hey, Johan, can you give a virtual presentation to our class of 2020? I'm giving this talk right now. On Tuesday, I'm gonna to talk to a couple other students. We're gonna have a Q&A about what this talk means for you. Because so far, 2020 has been a tough year. It's one of those years where you feel like, man, I just need to catch a break. And have you ever felt that way? You guys know what I'm talking about, right? It's that feeling where you work so hard for something and then in an instant, it's snatched away. For example, you finally muster up the courage to ask your crush out on a date. They say yes, you're all set up to go to prom with the love of your life. You pick out your outfit, you rent a Maserati to cruise in, and then a pandemic hits. Now, maybe four months ago, this example would have been cheesy. I mean, you would have looked at me and said, that's nuts, like that would never happen, but how about now? See, if we weren't currently living this insane reality, you might've thought that was a bad plot to a low budget film on Netflix. Pandemic Prom Night, starring Zac Efron and the cast of Sharknado. I mean, you guys can picture it, right? In a world where prom reigns supreme, one boy, one girl will be at home playing safe instead of going to their prom. They don't we <coughs> my voice. <coughs> they don't want to be they don't want to be crowned with this girl now. And yo, I wish this was just a plot to a bad movie, but it isn't. It is our current reality. In the blink of an eye, our whole life has shifted. Instead of hanging out with friends, you guys are social distancing from your classmates. Instead of going to prom, I mean, word on the street is you guys won't even be having a prom. And then there's graduation. Instead of graduating the traditional way, I heard that you guys are gonna be experiencing a driving graduation, which is actually kinda of cool, and I wish I did that when I was in high school. But some of you may have been looking forward to the traditional graduation, and you may be asking yourself, what did I do to deserve this? I mean, you may be saying, life, it's, it's, it's just not fair. You may be thinking, why is this happening to us? See, what if I told you that we have a choice in how we view the most difficult, hard to explain, painful moments of life. And I'll say it again, we have a choice in how we view the most difficult, hard to explain, painful moments of life. From some of the conversations that I've had with your teachers and classmates, you guys know what I'm talking about, those pueblos. See, 2020 hasn't been an easy year for you guys. You've experienced some of the most difficult moments of your young life. There's been tremendous lost this year. You've experienced hard to answer questions. You've gone through pain that will shape you forever. And what I wanna be clear with today is that we can go through the most difficult, hard to explain, painful moments of life and ask, why is this happening to me? Or we can ask the question, why is this happening for me? And don't get me wrong, this type of posture for life it is not easy, but most life-changing things aren't easy. Which brings me to growing up in Chicago, best city in the world, um, but I'm not biased. Some of you may be watching The Last Dance. If you aren't, it's a documentary that revolves around a guy named Michael Jeffrey Jordan in the championship run of the 97-98 Chicago Bulls, the greatest team of all time, but I ain't here to argue with you. Also, it ain't easy to argue with a dude while he's in quarantine in his house in Los Angeles. What you gonna do? If you wanna argue, hit me up. DM, Johan Speaks, let's do this. And as a little guy, I loved Michael Jordan. I'm talking about my whole life revolved around wanting to be like him. I picked up the basketball for the first time when I was 10 years old, and I just fell in love with the game. My only problem was I was short. I was really, really short, like mini me type short. I was so short that people would always block my shot. So I learned how to shoot. I mean, from very far away, as far away as you could think from the basket. And that was my specialty. Every single day I'd go out and I'd shoot hundreds of jump shots. I became so good that I got recruited to play high school basketball, which was a pretty big deal for me. There was only one problem. I was still short, very, very short. I'm talking about like Kevin Hart short. I was five foot two my freshman year of high school and people would always say, you're never gonna make varsity if you don't grow. And that made me mad because 
they said, you know, you're a good shooter, but you need height to get to that next level. And from that point forward, I was determined to grow. I would do everything that I could. I mean, I would hang from pull up bars. I would just like jump up and jump down just randomly. I would try to touch really high ceilings. I would ask friends to like grab my arms, other friends to grab my feet and just like stretch me out in hopes that I would grow. And none of it worked. I mean, I was still short, really, really short. Like the dude from Game of Thrones short. And then it happened. The moment that changed everything. My PE teacher gave me a piece of wisdom that changed my life forever. One day during class, he said, we grow while we sleep. And if we wanna to go to our maximum potential, then we need to sleep eight to nine hours a night. You best believe that was my new religion, sleepyanity. That doesn't sound right, does it? But you guys know what I mean. I slept a lot. My bedroom became my sacred place. I bought a humidifier, one of those sleep masks, got me a noise machine, and I made sure my butt was asleep every night at 10 p.m. Wake up, 7 a.m., nine hours every night, clockwork. That was me, my life, let's go. And as you remember, I was five foot two my freshman year. My sophomore year, I was five foot four, so I grew two inches over a summer, not that bad. My junior year, I was five foot 11. I grew seven inches over summer and the religion of snoozyanity was in full effect. It still doesn't sound right, huh? The name of my new religion, it doesn't really matter because my faith and hard work, it paid off. I made varsity. I was one of the best players on the team quickly because of my shooting ability. And even into my senior year, I continued to grow. By the time I was in my last year of high school, I was six foot one, captain of the team, and I was one of the highest scoring players in our conference. I was playing so well that I received a letter to play at the University of Chicago. Now this was my dream come true, but I didn't know what I needed to do next. So I made an appointment with my academic counselor. Her name was Sister Ruth. She was about 187 years old. You know, she had those thick Coke bottle glasses with the chain link attached. I remember walking in with this bravado, you know, I was like a boss knowing that I slept myself into almost a whole foot of growth over four years. There was nothing that could stop me at this point. So I sat down, I handed Sister Ruth the letter. She took a glance, right? She looked at me before putting her glasses on and as she was reading the letter, I'm just beaming. You know, I'm bouncing off the walls with excitement. I could barely contain myself. She reads a couple times, she glances at me up and down. And I remember like it was yesterday, she finished reading, she folded the letter back up, put it back in the envelope, handed it to me. And she looked at me and she said, you're never gonna make it. University of Chicago is one of the best schools in the nation when it comes to academics, and you're not smart enough. You may be good in the basketball court, but you can't cut it in the classroom. Now, if my life was a bad B movie, this would be the part where I get up in a state of rage, right? I flip over her desk, I run up to her, I grab a piece of her hair and rip it off of her head. I look at her and I say, to remember you by. And then I would storm out, slam the door, the glass would shatter. I would look at her dead in her face and say, your mama's not smart enough. And then I'd go to the University of Chicago. I'd wear her hair on my shoes as a reminder of who I need to prove wrong and become a star in and out of the classroom. And the name of my bad movie would be Hair Jordan. Hair, not like H-A-I-R, Hair Jordan. Man, I'm really bad at names. But unlike what we're going through right now, my life, you see, it, it didn't feel like a movie. It was pretty normal. I, I left that room and I asked myself, why is this happening to me? I mean, maybe she's right. Maybe I don't have what it takes. Maybe I'm not smart enough. So I decided to not go to the University of Chicago. See, that's the story of what happened to me. That was me feeling like a victim and nothing ever turns out my way. Why is this happening to me? When I was a senior in high school, trying to make sense of my pain, I wish a man from the future traveled into the past to tell my younger high school self that what just caused me embarrassment and pain didn't happen to me. It happened for me. That the pain is temporary, but it's also a powerful teacher. This man from the future would say, this moment, this moment right in front of you, it happened so that you can grow. And this moment, this moment right in front of you, it happened so that you could learn how to chase your dreams in the midst of uncertainty. You see, this moment 
would help me learn how to pick myself up when people knock me down. This moment would help me choose to use my voice to help others find their own voice. It would help me stop blaming the world for all my problems. And as hard as it was to feel and make sense of in the moment, it happened for me. And I know thinking about a man from the future telling me this sounds like another plot to a bad movie, doesn't it? But that's my life right now. I have shared that story across the world and I invite people into a bigger and better and bolder story for their future. Because what we think is happening to us is really happening for us. Those pueblos, see, I thought that this moment of my life had defeated me. I honestly believed that I wasn't smart enough to make it at the University of Chicago, so I didn't go. I didn't even make an attempt because of what happened to me, right? This, this victim, how could life do this? I didn't do anything to deserve this. You see, because Sister Ruth was the person who was supposed to help guide and nurture me so that I made the best choice for my life at that point. I felt like I couldn't catch a break. I look at my life and I'm like, I'm this kid from, from a poor part of Chicago. My parents were divorced when I was a little guy. I grew up around addicts. I went to school in fear of my life. I didn't even know if I would make it to the age of 18. So much of my life was happening to me. I didn't choose any of it. It wasn't until later in life that I realized, see, all of this stuff that was so negative, it didn't happen to me. It actually happened for me. See, what I've learned is that our moments of pain can turn into our greatest lessons. The people who we think broke our heart actually can teach us how to love. The loved ones that we've lost, they teach us how to grieve and live life to the fullest. And I've learned that the same opportunity is in front of you as you guys graduate at a drive-in. You see, because you can look at it and say, why did this happen to us? I can't believe that our graduation was stolen. Or you could understand that you know what you guys are doing? You're making it happen. Nothing can get in the way of your dreams. Nothing can get in the way of the life that you want. Dos Pueblos class of 2020, this moment isn't happening to you. It is happening for you. Yes, even the most painful losses are for us. You have had a difficult, hard to explain, painful year. And I'm not here to tell you to act like it hasn't hurt you or you need to see the bright side of things. I'm not here to say it's easy. What I'm here to say is I've traveled here from the future. As a man who has lost people he's loved, who had had people like Sister Ruth knock him down, who's grown up around addiction and violence and the difficult hard to explain, painful moments of life. They don't happen to us. They happen for us. And everything that you couldn't control this year, Los Pueblos, I'm gonna say it again. It didn't happen to you. It happened for you. You will grow. You will learn, you will get stronger, you will persevere, you will adapt, you will tell this story for the rest of your life. Hey DP, my name is Ryan Caldy and I recently had the pleasure of sitting down with Johan Kalilian along with a few of my fellow DP seniors, Jasmine Alcantara, Abe de la Palma, and Karina Garone. Here's a few highlights of our conversation. I, I don't know how it's working for me. I, I'm still like trying to, like I've been reflecting throughout this time, trying to reflect like, how is it working for me? And I guess me, I still haven't gotten to that point. I'm still thinking like it's happening to me. I'm still mm. thinking about like, wow, I can't, I can't do anything that I, I had planned up, up until this point. So I guess I'm still thinking about it. I guess, the one positive aspect that is happening for me is like um, I have time to to do other things, to do other hobbies that like are 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 important to me. So I guess that's the only thing. That's a little bit more personal. Something more personal to me is that I've kind of grown throughout my years in high school to love track, and I don't know. There's something about it that just makes me really excited every time I do it and I started my sophomore year and I was probably like the slowest girl on the team 
I don't know. I was so incredibly slow, and I think a lot of factors really played in and how I viewed myself, and my self-confidence kind of went down from there, and I just felt like I really wasn't good enough to make it anywhere, or I wasn't good enough to even compete at my school, and I think this quarantine has taught me how to reflect on that and practically give me time to focus on whatever I want to do in the future. So right now, you know, there's so much time that is given to me. So I want to be able to use that time to, to train my butt off and, you know, have that platform to build off of. So in the future, I can, you know, kick them butt. That's right. Kick yeah. the butt. All the butt. <laughs> I, <laughs> I don't know if that's appropriate to say, but. I think no, it you're is. Good. You're I, good. Think, I think if, if we don't have permission, let everybody know I said it was okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I totally get that, Jasmine, though. Um, in sports, they talk about being in midseason form. Um, so it's kind of like that, where once this all ends, you want to come out already, you know, being in that midseason form, being ready to go and already having yeah. been working. Not, and you're not going to have that, um, you know, that little bump in the road where you're going to take a little bit to get going again. You're going to be ready to go when it when, when this all ends, we get started up again. So that's definitely awesome to to keep that in mind, keep working that. Um, I think a little for myself, um, what's been keeping me um, going is, uh, and, and realizing that this is happening for me a little bit, is um, realizing that, you know, I'm very fortunate. You know, it sucks that we won't get a normal graduation or prom or anything like that, and it's valid to be upset about those things. But also, um, you know, I have no immediate family members who are sick with uh, the virus. Um, I had one extended family member who was sick, but they recovered, thankfully. And so, um, and I'm healthy and I'm fortunate to be going to a four-year college. And so those are things that not everyone can say. And that kind of, kind of reminds me to, um, even when things are normal, to also think in that way, sort of like, um, I lived in the Middle East for a long time in um, Jordan. And, um, you know, I'm very thankful for the opportunity to be here in this country, to, to have gone to DP, to, to, you know, it's just, there's so many things to be thankful about that, um. Kind of we don't think about all the people who don't have those opportunities because sometimes we're a little removed from that. So this kind of reminded me to try to keep that mindset a little bit. What's your goal and your mission in speaking around to all these different schools and kids? Yeah, well, I've been speaking for 15 years. And, um, you know, this has been my bread and butter for quite some time. I really love, for me, the biggest passion there is shaping culture through stories. Mm -hmm. So one of the biggest things, I grew up in one of the worst areas of Chicago. And just on a daily basis, you know, trying to figure out, am I going to get to school safe? Am I going to get home safe? Um, and then in my household, my uncle was an alcoholic drug dealer. He was a Latin king, which is a, one of the prominent gangs in Chicago. You know, he was a womanizer. Like everything negative that you could think of, he had inside of him. And I, and I lived with him. My parents were separated. It was my mom, my uncle, and my grandmother. And... You know, I remember one specific day where I was walking to school and as I was moving through the living room, my uncle was laid out on the couch. It was like, you know, eight in the morning and I see a bottle in his hand. The bottle is empty and the whole living room smells like liquor. And he's like drooling from the mouth. His eyes are rolled back. And I just froze for some reason. I started to ask myself this question. I'm like, am I going to be like him? Like, is that what my future is going to be like. And I was 11 years old, you know? Um, and I would see the things that he would do. He, he would steal from my grandmother. There were times where he would come home and he, his head was beaten in because he was a Latin king. We grew up in a rival gang area. You know, he, he did things like um, when my grandmother did pass away, I remember we were driving. It was a funeral procession to, to bury her. And he took a drug deal. He basically paused all the cars jumped out of the car and he took a drug deal in the midst of the day that my grandmother was going to be buried. You know, like this was the type of human being that he was. And, you know, on this particular day, as I was asking these questions of like, am I going to be like him? For some odd reason, I just said, no matter what, I'm going to be the complete opposite. Everything that he's done, I'm going to do differently. You know, I'm never, I'm never going to do drugs. I'm never going to drink. I'm never going to join a gang. I just want to live a totally different life and as i left the house that day i was determined to be a better person one of the greatest gifts that we can give 
you know, to the next generation is to pass on our wisdom. And old cultures, you know, old tribes and villages, you know, the old school, the old world function that way. They would tell stories and pass on wisdom so that the next generation would actually live a better life, a more enriched life. And I feel like at times we have lost that in our world. And that's a big part of why I do this is because I want to bring this back. And then hopefully, you know, you guys may not do it as a motivational speaker, but what you guys can do is take this story applied to your life. And then you pass on a story to wherever it is, your brothers and sisters and cousins, your classmates. And then one day you'll have kids and you can keep passing things on from generation to generation. And that's how we get better as humanity. Mm -hmm. For sure, man. Yeah, definitely. I think part of that is kind of thinking um, that, you know, there's no way that we get through this unless we rely on each other and we, you know, we check in with our friends and we, we try to celebrate them and appreciate them and see, you know, you know, maybe one day that you were struggling and the other next day your friend is struggling, try to be there for each other when you can. What's been the hardest part of basically experiencing your senior year in the midst of this? What's been the most difficult thing you guys have experienced so far? I would say not being able to see those people, like the seen like there are a few seniors who've had like a rough year. Mm. You know, it's just like so much they've lost all throughout the year. And I think it kind of comes with my position again. It's I wanted them to, you know, to be able to celebrate themselves for all the hard work they put in. And mm -hmm. like the people, like the students who are, you know, less fortunate or who haven't had, you know, like the best of, you know, the best of year or those who are like the first generation high school graduates. Like, you know, I've always seen gr like graduation as a time to celebrate, you know, everyone's hard work. And so now it's like, you know, no prom, no senior awards, no senior week or graduation. The thing is, it's not that serious. Mm -hmm. Like, it's never that serious, you know? And usually I, I, especially in my young life, I would take things so seriously. I would think that one decision is going to make or break the rest of my life. And, and then the older I got, the more I realized, oh, I can make a decision and it just be, let's see what happens. Yeah. There's, there's experiment, there's exploration, there's me discovering. Mm -hmm. And I think you guys will start to figure it out. You know, I would say in your teenage years right now, and even in your twenties, figure out who you want to be, like explore, discover, mm -hmm. take risks, create experiments for yourself. And then once you get into your thirties, now you're solidifying Sort of your identity in a, in a deeper way you know maybe your career is a little bit more solidified as well because i'm 40 years old like i said and i feel like i'm i'm just getting started like after 15 years of speaking experience so much has clicked and now i'm looking forward to the next 40 years of my life and part of it was i took myself so seriously for a long time the more i started to lighten up and realize hey some things are going to work out some things aren't mm -hmm. that is the way that life is yeah so the lighter that I take it, I think the more that I open myself up for life surprises as well. Yeah. Well, thank you for talking with us, um, Johan. Really appreciate you coming to talk to our school, even if it's virtually, and for having this conversation with us, and for always trying to spread your message to us and to you know kids everywhere. So you're doing you're doing awesome things in the world, man. We appreciate it. It's yeah, my pleasure, guys. For sure. Thanks for hanging out with me today. Thank you.